America Live. Brought to you from the Eternal Word Television Studios in Birmingham, Alabama. Network is built on trust. The essence of evangelization is to tell everybody Jesus loves you. We are all called to be great saints. Don't miss the opportunity. Well, here we are. So we know there are many things in the world today not right. You know, we all know that. And so it's our <coughs> obligation as Catholics and Christians to live our lives and to do what we do for God in the best way possible. To repair. Like if you went to confession and you said, I stole... Um, 55 tube of fours, see? Well, you have to return the tube of fours. You have to do something about that, you see? You just can't say, well, I'm sorry. And the father says, where is it? He said, well, I built a house with it. Oh, where So, you see, you got to repair. We're not accustomed to repairing today. We're accustomed to just say, I'm sorry, when that's certainly a beginning. And so all of you that are ill, terminally ill, for example, and you know you don't have far to go before you meet the Lord, you have to repair. Say what? Well, you can offer your pain, your sufferings. You offer to God for the world, for the world. The world is torn apart, really. You know that. So do I. And we have to repair. As Catholics, where you receive the Eucharist, you repair, see? So if you put more love in your love for a lady, more devotion to the Eucharist, you repair. Hmm? This morning I heard of a church that um, they have too much, too many hosts in the Ciborium. They, they take those hosts and put them in the bag where the hosts for tomorrow are. They're not even consecrated. And the, the deacon said, oh, we don't waste them. We just use them again tomorrow. Well, what is that? So you and I, when we know about it, we have to repair for that. Somebody has to repair. And if you love someone and they've been deeply hurt, what do you do? You talk to them, you buy them some candy, some flowers, you do something, you know. A person that's grieving a death, you go and give them a hug, you say you're sorry, maybe you make them a dinner or lunch, you repair. Where our world is not in the habit of repairing, it's got it into the habit of destroying. See, that's why with a, a abortion so prevalent and we, have, we don't have that heart anymore that feels sorry for that little kid that's torn apart. Well, are we repairing for this before God, see? We call it reparation, we repair. So, so many, as you get older and your, your legs begin to creak, You should be able to sit on the floor. Now you can't sit on the floor because if you sit on the floor, you, you can't get up. 
and the person trying to help you can't get down. <laughs> so two of you in one house is pretty bad, you know. You got to look to wit see which one's going up or down. <laughs> and that's life. I mean, you know, I can't do the things I used to do. Even with my healing, you know, I can't run because I didn't have run for forty-five years. But still, there are many things you can do. Well, if I can admit that, I'm repairing. See, because our pride is such that we think we have to be the same today as we were thirty or forty years ago. You don't look the same, and you don't notice that you're changing. Did you ever look at your picture now and then look at it 20 years ago, 30 years ago? You don't recognize yourself. You'd say, oh, I look pretty good then. <laughs> well, that's true. You did look pretty good then. So what are you saying? You don't look pretty good now. Probably true. Those little wrinkles start. You got oh terrible. You think of a safe lift, face lift, rather, and but that makes you look worse. I think it does because you get tight like. <laughs> <laughs> now, if you look in the mirror after a face lift and think you look good, because mm, mm -mm. it changes your face. You see, your face at this point looks good with wrinkles. Because at your age, you should have wrinkles. You look better that way. So we're, we're not after repairing. We're after changing all the time. And although life is changeable, it's always changed. Always. You know? You get up one morning, you really feel good. By golly, I'm on the upward swing. By noontime, you got to have orange juice. you got to have a sandwich. You, I mean, just to kind of pep yourself up after two cups of coffee, maybe in an hour, you might feel better. But it isn't like it was 20 years ago. So what do we do? We don't repair because we don't take that particular cross in our hearts and say, well. You know what I admired about Mother Teresa? Well, I admired many things about Mother Teresa, but her multitudinous wrinkles. Deep, you could put your finger in one. She didn't use any creed. She never went anywhere to lift her face up. She wouldn't look like herself if she didn't have all those deep wrinkles. And now with her new, you know, people are trying to make her look better. I mean, these pictures they're painting of Mother Teresa, she's got at least 20 less. Wrinkles. I counted it one time. <laughs> I think I have nothing else to do. <laughs> but I got a real picture of Mother Teresa and I counted this painting. You know, it didn't look like her. I, I know she won't have wrinkles in heaven, but it didn't look like her because the, the labor, the trials, the you know, she was seven years on the streets there, living by herself in a little place, taking, trying to take care of the poor and the desolate and lepers, and they didn't like it, the government didn't like it, and seven years of agony. Those wrinkles were created by pain and suffering. I don't think you can take them off, you know? I saw a man uh, last week I hadn't seen for quite a while. Had a terrible, 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 terrible trial. He changed. He was more quiet, more prayerful. But his hair was white. And you knew this man had gone through hell. And, and you felt so bad. It, I felt bad I couldn't have been there and helped him out somehow. 
But there was a change, see. And then as you and I go from change to change, and we don't always realize that although I must accept what I am and who I am, and there's nothing like building to make you know who you are. You know, I, I try to be a nice nun. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes I try to be a holy nun. <laughs> Sometimes the real me comes out. It's neither nice or holy. You know why? Because I can't stand to be cheated. I don't care if you're a prostitute, a murderer, a thief, a liar. I can accept all that and try to get you out of it. But try to cheat me or right, give me an inferior product, or don't do it right, I lose it. Because I think it's a grave injustice. It's done to almost everybody. You go to a store and you think, this is for sale, it was $50. No, it wasn't, it was never $50. If you read last week's newspaper, it was 20 Now it's a big sale. It was 50 and now it's 30 it just made ten dollars. <laughs> right, I can't take that kind of stuff. Just can't take it because uh, it's a lie. And we're accustomed to lying. You know how I know? Because a lot of people look at a nun. You're not supposed to be too bright when you're a nun. I mean, you know, you have to be a little touched in the head to be a nun anyway, <laughs> in most people's eyes. And so, you know, you're missing so much out of life. Well, I don't know, because looking at some of you, I'm not too sure you made it either. <laughs> <laughs> All this stuff burns me up. I try very hard to overcome it, but then when it gets bad, I blow, because it's unfair to God unfair to that. But most people will tell you today what you want to hear. They figure you out. What do you want to hear? You want to hear you're beautiful, wonderful. But maybe you're not. Now, I don't expect for somebody to come up and say, Mother, you ain't what you used to be. I'll agree with that. And if they would say you're ugly, I'll agree with that. But people, when you buy a car, he tells you all kinds of things. Even tires, they say, he's a wonderful tires. You ever notice, the other day I was going down the road coming home from the farm and I saw a car. It had three nice looking tires and then it had a little bitty one. <laughs> right in front. And I said to brother, that's an odd looking car. He said, why? Well, I said, it has two big tires and one little bitty one. Oh, he said, that's the extra they give you in case you have a flat. Now, I have a hard time with that, you see. Why don't you have the decency since you've probably been anywhere from twenty to $30,000 for that car to put a regular tire there? Why you gotta have this midget? And you see, the, what bothers me is it don't bother you. You got a spare tire. That's one of the sales things. You, I, you got a spare tire and it's free. Well, it's not worth two cents. <laughs> You're lucky it gets you to the next gasoline station. But we're so accustomed to this kind of thing, we don't get upset over it, see? And you know, I think that's why we have no concept of what the kingdom of heaven's going to be. Because we're not accustomed to truth. If those people at that particular church believed in the Eucharist, do you think they would take what's left over and put it with the rest that's not even consecrated? And use it again? Well, what is this, using it again? See, I don't understand that. 
And once we get accustomed to lies and telling people what they want to hear, and I wonder what you do believe. Because I don't think you believe in a kingdom, a kingdom of heaven, because you would want to be there. Don't you think you want to go to heaven? How many sermons have you heard about heaven? Hmm, nobody. Ain't nobody left up their hand. Not even our good priest sitting there. <laughs> I mean, when did you ever go to any church, your church, whatever it is, and hear about the kingdom of heaven? What is it like? If we knew that, we would want to go. See? Now, if you don't know that, and you don't believe in a personal God, God loves me the way all he loves everybody. Well, I'm part of everybody, but he loves me like no one else existed. Oh, that's a difference. He loves you like you were on this earth and there was nothing on it but you, and no individual, no, no animals, no grass, nothing, just an iron ball. And you're standing in the middle of this iron ball. He could not know or love you any more then than he does today. And when you die, your whole life, he'll know. He knows. It's going to pass before you. And then when you look like Jesus, if you die, you look like you're going right to heaven. But if we don't know that, then we are not going to live according to that. See, we, you can't put up with a lot of suffering or injustice or truth. It's, it's hard to be truthful today because people don't want to hear truth. They want to hear what they want to hear. So then you don't have a, a, a concept of a kingdom of love. I don't think there's anybody in the world that doesn't have at least one person they don't love, don't even like, and really don't do anything about it. Otherwise, we would have trouble forgiving. See, That's why the Lord said I should forgive before the sun goes down. Well, now, day, at daylight time, you got an extra hour. So. <laughs> comes in handy sometimes. <laughs> Before the sun goes down. You see, our dear Lord knew it's going to take time for some things. But he didn't want you to go to bed with an angry heart. Now, if we know that and we try to practice it, I will know what the kingdom of heaven is like. I will know how God loves me, and then I will know when I forgive someone, then I will know what God's forgiveness is all about because I have experience of forgiving. And that's what the kingdom of heaven is all about. It's total forgiveness from God with no memory on your part of anything you've ever done except you love God and he loves you. Now you begin to know what the kingdom of heaven is like. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed. Oh, no. Let's find out what the kingdom of heaven is like. I think I got it here. Well, which ribbon is it? Hmm. It's not this one. Oh. Well, and it's not this one. How do you like that, huh? Huh. Mm -hmm. Well, my friends, we're going to have to wing it. <laughs> because the kingdom of heaven is something that we live on this earth, or we live in purgatory, or we live in hell. It all starts here. You see some people that are so angry with the world or hateful. 
or just have never loved and maybe been loved. People who love evil. I talked to a man one time and he said his idea of a good time was to go in a smoke-filled den, sit at a bar and get drunk. Is that your idea of the kingdom of heaven? You like that? That's not the kingdom of heaven. You go out on a date and you have all kind of affairs and you get drunk and you don't know what you're doing. You, what do you say? I had a great time. Did you? Is that your idea of the kingdom of heaven? Oh, it's not. What is the kingdom of heaven for you? Is it a big car? Oh, wonderful. It's <laughs> Every day it's getting older, like you. One small wreck and you've had it, total. Why? Because that beautiful car is made out of plastic. The fender's gone. Well, the fender in my day used to be made out of metal. If you bump that fender, believe me, you could straighten it out yourself. But now, you see that fender is still in all little shreds of something there. So all that money you spend won't even take a bump. One of my sisters went to a store one time and this man gave me a bicycle. Well, when I was a kid, a bicycle was a bicycle. You got on it and you went. But this was 10 speed. Did I don't know anything about 10 speed bicycle. In my day, you went whatever speed your legs went. <laughs> How do I know about a 10 speed bicycle? And I said, oh, that's wonderful. I thought, well, you be like a car. You can go five miles an hour or 50, but I didn't know what it was really like. And so I came home with it. One of my sisters had, had loved bicycles, and she got on it, and she started up at the hill. But she had never seen a 10-speed bicycle either. She comes down, but she can't stop, because when <laughs> she tried to stop, it went up to another speed. <laughs> So she hit one of our employees' cars. The thing that amazed me was she dented the car with her little nose. Always oh, broken, it's bad. And I thought, I looked at the car and I thought, now, do you think your nose ought to dent a car? <laughs> huh? I, I thought it'd be strong enough. I knew it would break her nose. Took out a couple teeth, too. But she dented the car. And I thought, what kind of car is this? Well, we live in a, an idea of darkness, see? Darkness. And we're satisfied with the least. With the least. If you go out on a date, you have an affair, you get drunk, you have drugs, you will never know what the kingdom of heaven is like. Never. Because you're not living the kingdom of heaven. It starts here, my friend. Starts here. See, this gospel here. My sisters upstairs are trying to tell me that if I'm looking for something, it's in Matthew 13. Thank you. Hmm. I hope they're right. Otherwise, we'll never know what the kingdom of heaven is like. 1344. Well, wow, thank you. 1344. Hmm. I think you're wrong, too. No, you're right. Thank you. The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure. A treasure in a field, which someone has found. He hides it again, 
goes off happy, sells everything he has, and buys the field. Now, now what does that mean? If we know God and we are trying to live heaven here, is it easy? Oh, no, because I have to change to get into heaven. I must be live, be, begin to love those who do not love me. I have to begin to forgive those that are not nice to me. I have to begin to prefer the things of God to the things of the world, the things I want. And the enemy. You know, I never saw so much Satanism in drugstores, big stores. They're making money on these ugly, 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 ugly costumes. Mm. Is that ugly monster that you have your kids wear on their shirts and on their faces, do you think that's the kingdom of heaven? Do you think after this life that you live and suffer from all the time, that that's what you're going to have? See, he says it's like, a, it's something you know is valuable and wonderful. And you sell all you have, and that all you have is yourself. That means that you're willing to die to yourself to get that pearl. And the pearl is of great price. That's a come easy. Our dear Lord in here never said it would be easy. Never, 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 never. He said, blessed are you when you're persecuted. Well, who wants that? He wants everybody to love you. <laughs> you want everybody to think you're great. The greatest compliment I ever had in my religious life I, and all my time on television was one of a certain individual, whose name I won't mention, wrote an article about me, rather nasty one. I enjoyed it. And he said, if it wasn't for Mother Angelica, we'd have made more headway. <laughs> Thank you. I don't want you to make any headway. Hmm. Because we have to have in our mind that I want to go to heaven. And I want to be with God. So if it takes pain, if it takes suffering, this man had to go sell everything he had. He had to be poor in spirit. He had to give up everything he liked, everything he loved, everything he was accustomed to, every leisure, all the good food he could have eaten, all the assurance, he had a lot there to take him through. He had to give all of that up. Why? To buy this field. But what was in the field? A pearl. Nobody ever saw. And that not that like heaven, huh? Are we all anxious? You know, there's all kind of books about people who had near death or death experiences. We want to see what happened to them. Well, the same thing happened to all of them. They knew who they were, suddenly. They, all their sins were before them. Boom. And then they knew there was a place they could not go beyond. They had to come back. I'll make a bet that 99% of the things that bothered them before didn't bother them anymore. Why? They saw the field, and they saw the pearl. Suddenly, nothing mattered. Nothing. See, if you don't have in your heart a goal, is the goal of this world? No. Because it passes. Everything passes. Everything. Do you notice how time is passing? Huh? Seemed like yesterday I put away that Christmas tree and now I'm looking for another one. I thought this morning, you know, in a few months I'll be 78. 78? 78. And all those 78 years seem to pass so quickly. Where am I going? 
Am I looking for that pearl of great price? Am I looking for heaven? Do I want to be there? Well, it's like a pilgrimage. Most of you are on a pilgrimage. You come from a certain city. You're on a bus. It's very uncomfortable. You have to go to the bathroom. Every, there's very, everybody's there before you. <sighs> You're hungry, but nobody's stopping to eat. Everybody's smart enough to bring their own sandwiches. You may sing hymns, but you're getting tired sitting. And it's the same on an airplane. It took us 11 hours one time to come from Spain to the United States. Something about a headwind or back end wind or something. Some kind of wind. And we were 11 hours. I was dizzy when I got off. Long. But I was happy to be in your home. And it didn't matter so much. Every mile was another mile home. Is that how we feel on earth? Do I even know there's a kingdom? And how do I get there? I've got to get rid of me by becoming like Jesus. And selling, the, selling all I have. The greatest gifts each one of us has is our memory, intellect, and will. I can say yes to God, and I can say no to God. Oh. But then I shall possess a greater good. That's what our Lord said. The kingdom of heaven is like that. And then he says, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant looking for fine pearls. And when he finds one of great value, he goes and sells everything he owned and buys it. Now he talks about the same parable twice. So my ideal in life then should be, I want to go to heaven. I want to be with God. So then you take all the sacrifices and all the pain and all the joy, and all the good, and all the evil, all together as my payment. But we don't ever pay because it's a gift from God. But when God gives me a gift, I want to give him something back. Do you know how a pearl is, is, is formed in this little oyster? Well, a tiny piece of sand gets in this little guy about that big aggravates him. So what happens? His little whatever it is in there begins to form a kind of liquid to protect him. Because it aggravates him. And then that gets hard and you have a pearl. See, you can't even buy a pearl with something he's not suffering for it. Look at silk. Oh, he loves silk. Okay, but that little worm, what you're really wearing is the spit from a worm. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you paid good money for that. You know, here in Alabama, they have, not like they used to, but there are quite a few cotton fields. I get so excited when I, this little bush, like little shrub, grows material. Don't you think that's awesome? No? Well, do we take those awesome things God does for us for granted? I looked at that, that, far, that the land and it was full of little, little, little white puffballs, about this big. I thought, gee, maybe that's my new shirt over there. <coughs> I think it's awesome. Now you look at a sheep. Not too good, you know. We had sheep. Where are they smell? Here's this sheep going his way. He doesn't know he's wearing your clothes. <laughs> he doesn't have the slightest idea that your new sweater next year is on his back. Did you ever pet a sheet and say, oh, there's my next wife? 
<laughs> leather. Oh boy, you gotta have leather these days. I went to see a man one time asking for some money and I went to his office, his floor was leather. Leather squares. I said to myself, he won't give a dime. It's all on his floor. <laughs> now leather is a skin from some kind of animal. People don't like to buy fur coats because there's all these little animals up and down around your neck. Oh, that's terrible. But what do you think when you buy a leather purse? It's a skin from somebody, a cow. An alligator, that's a good pair of shoes for you. An alligator skin. So God has made all of this to clothe you, to make you warm. That's the God of heaven who does all of these things for us. Awesome. Awesome. And now, you see, we don't think of that. So we don't have a desire to see this God who has been so good to us. Who put wool on an animal and cotton on a bush. <laughs> and silk at a work. See, then I would know God. And if I knew God, and I knew he loved me because he keeps forgiving me. Love forgives you. Love gives you mercy. And then that's that pearl that I want. And you have to ask yourself, again, he says, the kingdom of heaven is like a dragnet cast into the sea that brings in a haul of all kinds. Well, all kind of people go to heaven. You're going to be surprised when you get there. I bet there's a couple of people who say, oh, I don't believe you made it. <laughs> and he'll say, I don't believe you made it either. <laughs> so our Lord says that all kinds of people get to heaven. It is full, that dragnet is full. The fisherman hauls it ashore. Then sitting down, they collect the good ones in a basket and throw away those that are of no use. Now that says to you, whether you believe it or not, there is a heaven and there's a hell. Where are you going? Where do you want to go? And he says, this is how it's going to be at the end of time. Sisters, I talked today to some woman and she <coughs> wanted to come and see me the day that she wanted to come. I won't be here. But anyway, she said, well, I, I want to talk to Mother. Well, okay. She says, I have to ask her something. Okay, you can telephone me. I'd be glad to answer for you. But she has a desire. I have to desire heaven before I get there. And I have to know that if I don't try, if I don't love the Lord, I'm going to be like the fish in that dragnet that's gone back. I will never see God. See, these are realities. See, and nobody's telling you that. You know, we have a free will, but there's some things you can't do without destroying yourself. And this, Star Lord, just says here, the angels will appear and separate the wicked from the just and throw them into a blazing furnace. <laughs> you know, I think the people who preach there's no hell never read the scriptures. I think they read what they want to hear. Our Lord calls hell a blazing furnace where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth, frustration, anger, hatred, 
You, you, you can't imagine there a place there is no love. I mean, have you ever? Well, we have to begin to desire heaven. And then when something comes along in your life that's going to have the power to, to draw you away from God, which is to draw you away from heaven, you will say, no. You're not going to do this. But first has to come the desire for God and the desire of heaven. Now, how are you going to get all of that if you don't know? You know, our Protestant brother has a lot to teach us. Really. Because he believes in a personal God. I live in the Baptist Belt. We got the only church in the whole wide world built by Baptists. <laughs> I think that's humorous, don't you? <laughs> we must have a hundred men up there building and not one is a Catholic. And they're building, I think, I wouldn't think that way anyway, one of the most beautiful churches. Well, they have a personal God. They don't have the doctrines and the dogmas we have. But that building is something made by their hands, their talent. And they got talent they never knew they had. But a personal God has to be in everyone's heart, mind, and soul, especially when you receive the Eucharist every day. That's the body, blood, soul, and divinity. You can't put him in a jar with other things. You can't. You can't. Now, when you have that kind of a gift from God as a Catholic, you have to desire heaven. What else is there? And I think it's a possessive thing, all our computers. You know. It's a terrible thing when you have a car, you, you can't open the door unless some little gadget that big decides you can. And if it doesn't work, you can't open it. We're so dependent upon our own creations. And that's why when you become comfortable with all the things of this world, you can't desire heaven. What would you desire? You got it all. You're satisfied. That's why there's pain and suffering. I, I think it's wonderful. Because pain and suffering and trials take away from us the desires that are not fulfilling us. And you know, as well as I know, the things you work hard for and the things you want, once you get them, they turn to ashes. The fun's gone. St. Paul says that so many work so hard for a crown that perishes. They used to have these Leaf crown. Well, who cares for that? People sell their soul for an honor. And all these things pass quickly. It doesn't matter, though, you see, if you know where you're going. It doesn't. So ask yourself tonight, do I desire heaven? Do I really want to be with God? Is that my goal? If it is, then you've got to change. Because you're not heading up, you're heading down. Okay? We have a call. Hello? Yes. Hello, Mother. Hi. Uh, this is Anthony. Oh, hi, Anthony. Where are you from? Uh, Boston, Massachusetts. Boston. Wonderful. Uh, my question, Mother, is uh, I've heard you say that God 
knew me before the creation of the earth, and I find this to be mind-boggling. Oh, it is. And I'm wondering, uh, does that come from Scripture? Oh, yeah, it's everywhere. Uh, before I was in my mother's womb, you knew me. You knit me. That's what it said. In my mother's womb, you, oh God, knit me. You made me. You created me. See, to God, you, there is no past or present, or there is a present, no past or future. Everything is now. So he saw me then, before he created a blade of grass, or said, let there be light, as you find in Genesis. He knew me. He knew what century I would be born. He knew my mother and father. He did everything possible for me to be created. That's why it's so terrible to offend him because after he waited all these centuries, I came along smart aleck. That don't sound right, does it? It doesn't sound like we should do that. But it's true. It says this in the Psalms. You know, when uh, Moses said, who are you? When I go to these people, what am I going to say? Who sent me? He said, say, I am sent you. Not I was or I'm going to be. I am sent you. So God is eternal. There was never a time he was not. And there will never be a time he will not be. He's always there, never had a beginning. He was always there. Don't ask me how. He's God. He's a whole different nature, divine nature. He always was, but somehow, out of a possible 60 billion people who might have been, he made a decision. And that decision was me. And that decision was you. Mm -hmm. That's why abortion is so bad. Abortion is blasphemous mu uh, uh, murder because it denies God what he decided before time began should be. You deny that. You say, no, it won't be. I'd watch it. The truth of birth control. You're making a decision when you're going to have a baby. Now, maybe God had in mind something entirely different, and you say, no. Mm, you better be careful. Yeah, hey, friend, if you're deciding tonight on an abortion, you're deciding against God first and foremost, and then you also decide against the life of a child. You know, if you ever think of how many scientists, uh, how many other children will never be? For example, how many millions of people have been aborted? And that's all you count, a million and a half a year, Oh, but those people would have gotten married, and that's another million and a half. And those children would have gotten married, and that's another two million, and somebody else. You have not destroyed a baby. You destroyed generations. You see? We don't think of that. If you're listening to me tonight, and you're deciding tomorrow you're going to have an abortion, don't. You're not going to destroy one child. You destroy many children. They will never be. Because God has already decided that child shall be. And you said no. And if you've had these abortions, please repent. Please. Our Lord's mercy is beyond our imagination. So I destroy the will of God because you can read the Psalms, you can read the great I am. 
And our dear Lord said to the Pharisees, I think we read it this week's Gospel, when he threw out all the money changers and made a rope and beat them up. Kind of like that sometimes. He said, who are you to do this? What proof do you have that you have that authority? He said, I will destroy the temple and in three days raise it up. But they didn't know what he was talking about. And had the slightest idea. Why could he say that? Because he knew it was going to rise. But who can rise from the dead on his own? Only God. Before Abraham came to be, he said, I am. Oh, wow. And in Scripture, this book of Genesis, we read where the Lord said, Let there be light. And there was light. There's nothing new before God. Read your Psalms. Read who Jesus said he was. He said to, to Peter, who do men say that I am? And some said, you're Elias, and some said this and that. Or John the Baptist, come back to life. He told you, say I am. And Peter said, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. Oh. But what did he say? He said, the Father has revealed this to you. So there standing before them was the great I am. In that Eucharist, that maybe you've lost faith in, who humbled himself to a small wafer, is the great I am. You may have lost your faith or been the cause of others losing their faith. He will always be. You will never destroy him, and you will never destroy his church. For I will be with you, he said, to the end of time. So throughout the scriptures. And then there's one sentence I love so much. I go to prepare a place for you, that where I am you may be. And then he said, if you keep my Father's commandments, he and I will come make our home in you. And in my Father's house, there are many mansions. Ah, this is the beautiful sense of all. If it were not so, I would have told you. Ah. Oh, yes, my friend. If he doesn't know me before time began and didn't decide I would be, he would not be God. There are no surprises. He knew everyone that was ever going to be just that I am. I've been created by God and here I am. And there you are. What a wonderful thing. Nothing else matters. If we could understand that, if I know he loves me, then nothing else would matter. And we would seek to be with the one who loves me that much. Mm. I don't know anybody would do this for me. I don't know anybody. I wouldn't do it for anybody. But here we are. Well. I don't know if we ever got to think what heaven was like, but we do know at this point how to get there. I love you. And never forget, he loves you before time began. Bye now.